Welcome to the March 1st, 2021 Ordinance Review Committee meeting. This meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. First up on the agenda is the roll call. Laura, can you do the roll call, please? Sure. Um, Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Thorpe. Here. Member Peck. Here. And Member Napolitano. Here. Okay, we have a full quorum. Next up is public comment, and um, there's no one here for public comment, so I will skip the spiel this evening and uh, move on. If someone does join us later, they wish to speak, we'll allow them to speak. Moving on now to the approval of minutes of January 11, 2021 and February 1st, 2021. Do I hear a motion? To approve, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. And I'll second that. Motion made by Councilor Nash, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Discussion. Um, Laura. Just to say that Megan had forwarded some changes, which I no. have posted as red, uh, red bolded changes so everyone can see them. Mm -hmm. No discussion, Megan, everything's good. You know, I noticed that in, in the minutes after I left the meeting, Attorney Seawald asked if this committee can figure out how to diversify appointed boards and committees it would be an invaluable service. This is an intractable problem. That's been an issue the whole time he served on committees. I, I just want to say that I feel like there are kind of I mean, first of all, if you do some targeted outreach or recruitment, I mean, we have a policing review commission that is that started out more than 50% BIPOC. So, I mean, it, it works. I mean, academia, they found, figured out how to do it. Um, of course, like, you know, retention and level of cultural competence, that's, those are other issues. But I just wanted to say that. Seeing no further discussion, Laura, can we get a Mr. roll? Mr. Chair, nope, may sorry. I say that I, I didn't say since I've been serving on committees, I've said that I, since I've been serving as counsel to towns. And so uh, that's what I believe I said. I don't serve on many municipal committees. Uh, I can make that change. Thank you, Attorney Seawald. You can make that change, Laura. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you want a roll call? Yes. Okay. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Here. Me. And yes. Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. Moving on now to the review of language for section 312. Dot 43 parking for physically handicapped section 312-43 accessible parking with ADA coordinator edits. Okay. This was brought to our attention by Council Labarge and we were at this on the agenda. Can Laura, you're able to pull that up? Yes. Now I don't think I uploaded to the agenda the last email that I got from attorney Seawalt. So let me go into my email, my inbox. And okay. Um, um, can you ask? Do we, Megan's got her hand raised. Do we, Megan, do we, Megan. Do we need to approve the minutes for February 1st? They both should have been, com they both should have been done already, Megan. Oh, so, so we what I, together? We did them together. Okay. Because when I read off, it was both for both dates and that's what. Okay. I don't know whether, I'm gonna pull up the redlined version here. Let's see. Wait. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm. 
That's not the one. Yeah, yeah, I don't think this is. Wait a minute. Okay. okay. One second. I got it now. One second. It actually looks like this is the clean version. Okay. Okay, so we have the clean version. Council Labarge, would you wish to be heard on this? Um, I think I had talked about the language of accessible, and I know that on the Commission on Disabilities, we had another meeting on that, and Keith Benoit, our ADA coordinator, had sent in the language and I think, Laura, you had that from Keith. I do. I think that's what was sent to Attorney Seawald and that he has since Attorney incorporated Seawald. his changes. And it was questions about um, handicap signs and replacing it with accessibility and so forth. And this is why um, this has been turned over to Attorney Seawald to go through the language and make the um, language to be the right language. Thank you, Councilor Labarge. Attorney Seawalk, uh, would you like to be heard on this? Before I do that, can anyone tell me how to turn off the subtitles on my Zoom? Because hmm. uh, I have no <laughs> idea how they got turned on and I have no idea how to turn them off. But all of you are at the bottom of my screen and you're all being covered up by what everybody's saying. So I can't see any of you. I know uh, I can turn it off for everybody, but I'm not sure. If you go to down uh, in the bottom and you click on live transcript and then you click um, close full transcript or don't show subtitles, that should work. I'm on an iPad, so it's a little different. Um, full, view full transcript. And then I get the full transcript. But there separate. should be a hide subtitles or hide subtitle. Um, no, I'm, I'm not seeing that. Um, are you right. I'm not going to hold, hold everybody up to that. Um, so um, since I received uh, the the uh, the version that the commission reviewed and that Keith submitted. I made revisions just to simplify this and to um, and to make it read more concisely. I did get an email from Keith uh, saying that that the changes look concise and appropriate, and so I'm happy to take any questions. The way I see this, there are really two major sections. One has uh, oh somehow I'm now on twice. And it's opened on my computer over here. So let me leave over here. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, I just I really admitted no you again. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, don't, okay. So I'm now I'm back on my pad. Uh, and I do that because I'm having um, um, Wi Fi instability issues. So uh, that way I can go on uh, my cell phone. Uh, so um, is there, th this deals with both. Uh, access, accessible parking under a permit issued by the state and ex temporary accessible parking permits issued locally. And, you know, there's some confusion because the state and now we would propose to uh, use different terminology. And so um, if there are questions, I'd be happy to address them. Members, do you have any questions? Councillor Nash. I, I just wanna say, this is great. This is really terrific, the, the work that everybody's done on this. Councillor Barge, Foster, and, and, and Attorney Seawald and Keith. I mean, this is, it's really, it's the language is just much, much, it, it's, 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 it's so, it brings us up to date. It was so dated. It was so we, <laughs> embedded in, 
people coming out of the state schools and stuff like that. It looked like it hadn't been touched since the 80s. So um, this is is really, uh, really great stuff. And and also that the way things are worded is is very readable, very clear. And I also see that there's a few spots where we're still using some of the old language because we need to refer to it because that's what's in state law. And, um, and, and so we need to make that transition clear. So anyway, uh, hats off to everybody here. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Ditto. Um, anyone else like to speak to this? Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Now, Alan, there was a question about the signage in our city, and I had great concerns about that. And I know that the cost was one big question that I talked with Keith. Councilor Foster had known somebody in New York, a friend of hers, of finding out about what they use on their signs. If we took our signs that say handicap and we find like a sticker to place over it, would it stay? Would it be worth it? But uh, I don't know how you feel about the signs and the changing of it because wouldn't we have to go, it's just for the city of Northampton that we're doing this because other cities like East Hampton and wherever, they're, they have not changed or not going to be changing their signs. Wouldn't the registry of motor vehicles be included that when you go statewide with something like this? Right. I don't think there would be any um, proposal to go statewide arising out of what we're doing. Um, my concern is that they are still handicapped plates at state law, and these are, you know, state placards that are being issued. Um, I don't really have a strong feeling one way or the other. My, um, you know, I will leave it to the committee if they want, if you want to recommend to the, to the city council that, or to the Department of Public Works that there be a change in all the signs. I think that uh, uh, Donna's concern will be the cost. Okay, so people already who do have placards <laughs> and also their license plates which have the, the wheelchair handicapped accessible, we would have nothing to do with that, with changing that because that's through the state. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Sewell. Thank you, Councilor Barge. Anyone else? I can't see Megan, but I... I don't Megan, see her hand no. up. Oh, she doesn't? What? Megan, do you have your hand up? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Okay, so seeing that and seeing the work that's done, where would we like to send this? Does this go to bucket number one? I'm not sure that it, um, it, it matters for me for drafting. I mean, okay. I have existing ordinances that need the language updated and this will probably go in that column and um, you know, in that part of the report. Okay, so we just need to do a vote then to send this your way. So, Laura, I think. We're... Okay, is there a motion and a second? Motion to. Why don't I make a motion to to send it to bucket number one? Is that correct? That it goes to Attorney Sewell. Yep. Yeah. I second that. Okay. okay. Motion made by Councilor Nash, seconded by Councilor Lafarge. Okay, Laura. Okay, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Hmm. Member Peck? I'm sorry, oh, she's muted, but I see her mouth indicating yes. Um, Member Napolitano. Yes. yes. Hmm. Okay. Moving on to the final disposition of topics already reviewed, bucket number one, housekeeping changes and ordinance reviewed for impact on marginalized committees. Um, at the last meeting, I know Councilor Nash had to step away and uh, member Napolitano had stepped away. Um, so we um, ended up combining for easier purposes, the 
um, ordinances reviewed for impact on marginalized communities. So we took buckets two and three and put them together and um, had bucket one, the housekeeping changes up on the uh, spreadsheet. Laura, if you can get that bucket number one up in case so the other members can take a look at. Okay. Bucket number one and not the or the right. combined two not, and three. We'll go to that. Right. We'll, yeah, we'll go to that next and Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Oh. I'm working on it. Okay, here we go. Okay. Thank you. So I would, um, Laura, we want to start with page one again. Okay. Thank you. Do any members have any comments or suggestions regarding page one? Councilor Nash. Yeah, so um, so first of all, I wanna apologize to everybody on the committee for the way I ducked out last week. I had another meeting to run to and um, that I realized that, oh, I really have to go right now and everybody's still talking. And um, anyway, my, my apologies for doing that. Um, it wasn't right. <laughs> It's, it's okay, Councillor Nash. I told you already. My memory is long. My mercy is scarce. I know, but I know. <laughs> yeah, but there's there's other people on the committee, mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Thorpe. So, yep. <laughs> um, Councillor, I will point out that I was speaking at the time. I know. I know. So Attorney Seawald. <laughs> Attorney Seawald was like, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> No comment. <laughs> and um, and also, I just want to say, I want to make sure that member Peck, her, that her uh, audio is working. Um, yes, because... before. Megan? Where is she? Can't hear you. I can't see, I don't even see her. Megan? I don't see her either. I see her, but I can't hear her. Can you hear me? There you go. Okay, now there we hear you. Go. Okay, <laughs> I don't see her. There you are. Okay. So, all right. So um, now that I got us all off track on all sorts of things, um, I as I was going through this today, I was seeing that there was a number of things here that I, I, I it looks like we have more work to do on, and uh, not a lot of work. Just like we need to decide where some of these things are going to go, and and I think it relates to our final report and the narrative that we want to pull together. Um, so I, so I think the place to start is just to go one at a time through these. And, um, I think some of them, many of them uh, were, were like, okay, I think that's, that's going to the right place. But, um, anyway, that, that was my thought. Are you talking about items in bucket number one, Councillor Nash? Or are you talking about the items that we combined in two and three? Oh, I'm talking about two and three. Never mind. Right. We're in, we're in bucket one. So these are all the technical. Yes. Okay. These are great. Never mind. Okay. That was easy. <laughs> so, so once we get to the others, we'll, we'll go from there. But um, anyone have any suggestions, changes on uh, page one? No. And Megan, since I can't see you just jumping at any time, I just, I just can't see you on my screen right now. Laura, can we go to page two? Thank you. I have to admit, I hello. Yes. I have to admit, I haven't looked at these very closely. Um, it's mostly because these uh, came to us um, very early. Okay. Uh, September or October, um, before we had a good sense of our, like our schedule and um, how we're going to um, assess these. Uh, in relation to marginalized populations. Um, so I don't really know, oh, I really can't 
See how North. wetland protection fits into, fits with the other categories of problematic ordinances, but maybe Attorney Seawald has some ideas. These are the, these are the uh, ordinances these are the that, oh yeah, sorry. Nope, Jeff, please. No, no, I was just, um, my, my understanding was that these are the ordinances that had sort of um, technical uh, issues, either typographical or things like um, that referred to departments that didn't exist or that were renamed and so on and so forth. Yes. Um, that were brought to us at the beginning. And or, these changes came directly from the planning department and these are the proposed changes the planning department itself is making to these ordinances. You know, they've been compiling these technical changes that need to be made. Yes. So they've been reviewed by the planning department. So, okay. And I think on page two, it includes uh, Mr. Zimnock's uh, request to look at the width of streets. That's on this as well. And that's page three, maybe. Okay. Or you can go to page three. Sorry. No one's. Actually, this looks like still planning. Yep. Keep going. Nope. Yeah. Just oh, in case anyone has any questions on page three, okay. I just want to make sure. So I, I think all of this looks very much in order and okay. that um, and that I, you know, I, I don't think we need to approve sending these to council today, um, which, which uh, if member Peck would like to go through and, and, and review these, you know, we all have more time to do that. But this, this section looks like this is where we wanna be. And, um, you know, it, except for a, maybe a word or two here, if, you know, it, if we go deeper, but this, this, is, this is on the mark. So Laura, you can go to page four. And if no one has any... I just, Laura Nash, I don't feel the need to review them. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Good. Hello. All right, Laura, can we pull up the next screen with the ordinances reviewed for impact on marginalized communities? Sure. Let's see. Okay. It looks like Councillor Foster joined us to discuss the the language change around accessible parking. I don't know whether Councillor Foster has the latest edition version of it. Um, I'm happy, Laura. I'm going to ask to um, if we can um, put the screen to the side for a minute. If we can um, backtrack to what um, we just voted on to send to bucket one regarding the section for the parking for physically handicapped and the accessible parking for ADA coordinator edits on the screen. And it's already been voted in to go to bucket one, but I also would like to acknowledge and hear from um, Councillor Foster. Um, Thanks, Paul. I didn't mean to stop your meeting in its tracks. I was at a, another resident meeting and um, was hoping that I would may be over here in time for your discussion. So you move quickly. I see that. I was uh, amazed. Um, so well, I, gonna, you know what? We're going to pull up the what okay. was edited and, and, and after hearing from Keith Bornoy and Attorney Seawald made the changes. So we'll pull that back up on the screen okay. for you since you're here now. And um, the, the committee did vote to send this to bucket number one, just to let you know. Great. So Attorney Seawald, you had a chance to review it? Oh, yes. I okay. made significant edits to it today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So I haven't seen, obviously it's here on the screen. I haven't seen that the edited, but... Um... You know, I, th I think we, we um, and I apologize that the last time this was on the agenda, I, I, 
I, I hadn't realized it. So it's really just about updating the language, um, you know, from, from my perspective, and I know it needs to be technically correct as an ordinance, but it was about updating the language um, to be more current as far as how we're referring to people who have mobility impairments and people with disabilities. And so it's just that as I was reading through the language uh, from so long ago, it, it's, it struck me as, as outdated and using terms that, that we would no longer use. Um, so I, um, and the Disability Commission really preferred the term um, accessible in, in describing the parking and uh, the permits. How's it look, Councilor Foster, people? What I'm seeing um, as, as a quick read on the, on the side screen um, looks like it's incorporating those changes that were requested. So I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, if I, I can certainly take another look as well, but um, from what I'm reading uh, on, on the screen, that's looking like it's incorporating um, exactly what, what we were asking for. Okay. We all thought it looked really great, Karen. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> great. Councilor, bucket one. So, and, and, and Karen, this doesn't, and uh, Councilor Foster, this this isn't a, the final. This is just yeah. something that we refer to Council. There can be yeah. changes down the road, legislative matters, community resources, or you know, so it, it goes that way. So, great. Are you all set? I am. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much for for Thank you, hearing Councilor. here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's get Laura. We're going back to the Thank other you. spreadsheet. Okay. Let's see. Okay, here we're looking at the ordinances reviewed for impact on marginalized communities and I'm going to start with Councillor Nash because he looked like he was ready to jump into this beforehand. So. And my jumping days are over. I did that last week. <laughs> Questions. Well, you know, it requires landlords. And... Megan has her hand up. Yep. Megan. So I printed out this, um, and I'm not sure if it's the most latest version with the buckets two and three combined, but I don't the two ordinances that were on the agenda last week, 2181 and 2189. It was part of, it might have been part of Jackie Gallance's presentation. Um, zoning? That's the, the ordinance relative to affordable housing and the, um, that's 2181. That's line five on this spreadsheet. Yep. Okay. And also 20, oh, 2189, half scale units. No, I may not have added that one yet. That needs, okay, that's missing. Can, can, can I ask the, um, the committee what you would like me to say about these? Um, and, and this also goes for the two family by right. What would you like in the report given that these are already well through the council and um, you know, we're not really asking them to do anything that, they're, that the council is not actually already doing. So I'm just wondering you know, um, what it is. And I think I'd like the committee's guidance on what you'd like to say to the council um, on those issues. So um, I think it's the half scale and, um, and the local comprehensive permit and the two family by right. When I take minutes, are you guys seeing my minute screen? I'm, I'm having trouble because, no. no, okay, good. You're still seeing the spreadsheet? So I'm, yeah. Yes. But thank you. Member Napolitano. Uh, what I would say is just that we affirm uh, and support the passage of these things at the very least. Just being on record that um, we're in favor of them and we think that they should actually be implemented. 
My only concern is that some of them, and particularly the two family by right, might already be in the ordinances by the time we get this thing, you know, drafted and approved. But that's right. fine. I'll put it in there, and if you know, no harm done. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, agree with Jeff. I mean, he, uh, um, um, planning direct and director Fighten did come to speak to that. So, um, so. Um, okay. Well, I can I say. Yes, Megan. I, I feel like we could we could add a little bit more not a lot of nuance but you know more kind of broad strokes um, ideas about how they are impacting marginalized populations how they may impact marginalized populations because they haven't been implemented yet um, and we really should as a committee come to some kind of Consensus. What, what? What? How do we define marginalized? You know. Um, I wonder if we should do that before we start really getting into like what our final disposition is on any of these. If that's okay. I mean, for instance, you know, if you look at the. Um, the emails between that Laura forwarded us from Lisa Noit about the demographics of um, renters. Did you see that? The ACS census data. That was recently sent to us. Yeah, on the 25th. Isn't that what was shared with us? From um, Would you want this on the screen? Biden last week. Yes. I thought. Yeah. yes. Yeah, but we didn't have a we didn't really have a, a source for it necessarily when he presented it. Okay. So I think we need to clarify that when we talk about marginalized populations in this committee, we're referring to. Um, Low income renters, um, people with disabilities, and you know, feel free to jump in there. But, um, and that'll help us kind of have a lens on how, how these ordinances might affect, might affect them. I mean, the two families by right, um, you know, there, there was concern that they may spur more building of um, larger and, and therefore less market rate affordable homes in the short term. Um, yes, it will probably increase the housing stock, which, you know, normal times would lower, lower the prices. But, um, you know, um, so I, I thought we could Maybe start there. I mean, otherwise, you know, I, I feel like if this committee is just kind of just affirming what is going on already in the city, it really, you know, we don't really, I mean, we don't really need a review committee for that. Um, so, and I, like I said, it doesn't have to be terribly nuanced. It could just be, you know, with these sort of caveats, we we recommend this package of two families by right, and then there were the other two as well, which you know. So, right. I'm just thinking about Megan what you just said and trying to. Councilors Labarge and Nash have their hands up. Councilor, um, I'm going to go with Councilor LaBarge. Thank you. Um, I understand the concerns that Megan has. I have heard from people about the language affordable. What is affordable? If we're looking at homes that are affordable, they're up there. They're up there over 275, 290,000. And 
that's still a lot of money for a family of starting off to own a home. So I have concerns about the word affordable because to me, affordable home is not helping our marginalized residents that live in this city. Uh, I don't know. We're looking right now what's happening in the city, just what's happened off on Riverside Drive. I mean, you're looking at homes at 500 and something thousand dollars. There's no way a young couple with a family could pay for that house, period. It's not affordable. So when we're talking about affordable, what is the price bracket on that? We have Habitat, that's affordable, definitely affordable. And if we could have more of the homes that they build in our city, that is affordable and a family can go ahead and have their own home. Hopefully with the ordinances that we have now coming aboard from our planning department, will make a significant difference with the zoning changes in smaller homes, hopefully. We don't know what the cost would be to build those smaller homes, especially with what they're asking on energy efficient right down the line. So there's not a price tag on that one yet, but I do agree with the smaller homes. So I see where Megan has concerns here, even with people with disabilities. Right now on Glendale Road through Habitat, we are putting up a home now closer on the road, a smaller home, which is also handicapped accessible. Further in the back, we have one, two, four units, two buildings with new residents living in there about a year ago. That's affordable, affordable. So I can see where Megan's coming up at. And I think we need to look at that very, very carefully. Thank you, Councillor Barge. Well, Councillor Nash. Yeah, so I, there's three different ordinances that, and I think we're, I, I get them confused myself. So there's the, there's a flat out affordable housing provision to uh, the, the way it was described to us was to um, simplify the, the application process for a affordable housing developer to, yeah. um, you know, be able to submit a plan. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Then there's the two family by right, yeah. um, which is basically saying, if you have the space on your property, you can um, across the city create a two family house or you can create two single family homes on that property. And then the last one had to do with tiny houses or, or let's call them smaller units where if you build a unit under a certain square footage, it counts as only half a unit, allowing you to put two units in a place where, you know, it, 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 it's a way to expand the number of units that can be allowed on a property. Mm -hmm. So, those are they're, they're three different things and that um and that this whole thing it, it housing is it's so complex and and that we have little dials to adjust things here locally but we are subject to the rising tides of what's going on economically across the region and across the united states and right now that all housing everywhere it, throughout the Northeast is, is all becoming increasingly expensive. And mm -hmm. that, um, and that these, and that newer housing always, you know, especially if it's market rate tends to be more desirable, that people will pay a little bit more because they're the first person to live in the particular property. You know, it's like getting the new car and that, um, and that people will pay a premium for that. But that, um, but also, I, I, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about how that um, the, the new housing going in is, is so expensive. And I suggest that people, you know, um, whether they own property or rent property to go to Zillow and look up the property that they're living in right now. 
And that I think what many people will find is that their current property or properties throughout their neighborhood are also have risen dramatically. And that, um, and so that the newer uh, properties that are going in, such as on Ward, uh, on I think it's Ward, is that right? Um, in, in Bay State, um, they're, I don't think they're that much more expensive than some of those houses in that neighborhood. So um, anyway, it's all to say there, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of different moving parts here. And that, um, and, and I'll also say about the two single families, there's gonna be places where that extra, uh, that, that additional single family could be more affordable, but it could be that it's a big property out in the middle of an area where things are, um, where the homes are on the higher end and more, more desirable. It becomes an opportunity to create another high-end desirable home. So anyway, all of these things are, are really complicated and that, um, but the, of the three, the, 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 what I'll call the, the tiny house, the smaller unit one, that is, that is definitely targeting affordability. And so is that affordable housing um, change. That one is clear. The, the other one is around the two families gets less clear. Mm -hmm. in my view. Right. Thank you, Councillor Nash. Any other comments from oh, Councillor Labarge? Yes, Councillor Nash, when you say on the tiny houses that those are affordable. They can is, be. They can be. Okay. Yes. Because that language is better. Thank you. Yes. It, the, the, yes, it... it it is up to who's putting in the particular housing right. that, you know, whether it, I mean, you can make a tiny house that, you know, is going to be top dollar, you know, and, and, you know, state of the art kitchen and all of that, or you can make something that, you know, is something that you plan to, you know, use for, you know, a, a rental or, you know, or, or for family members or, you know, it doesn't always, it, it's going to be up to who's developing what. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just like on in Ward 6 on West Stanton Road. I have Habitat, which are condos, two units, two units, two units. Further down the road, which Jim, you've spent a lot of time with me on the intersection of West Farms Road and West Stanton Road. Further down, oh, probably about maybe two minute drive to the right a year ago or so 2.5 million houses built inside pools outside pools so i do have a mixture on my ward on glendale road with habitat and so forth so there are extremely large beautiful homes being built in ward six I'd love to see more affordable homes. Mr. Chair, can I can I just just point out there was a front page story on the in the Times this week um, about the lack of um, housing stock on the market, and you know so all of this is going to be cyclical like it always is. But right now, what we're seeing is um, a very low stock of houses on the market. And that of course, you know, drives the price of houses up. And, you know, part of it is people are, don't want people traipsing through their houses right now to look at their houses. They don't want to move to another house because things that they feel very insecure. Uh, there are any number of reasons that there's a low um, stock of houses for sale, but that will change um, and, um, but right now, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to equate Northampton with more major metropolitan areas, but in the metropolitan areas, housing is so, it's just through the roof right now. Um, the cost of, the cost of housing and the lack of starter houses on the market is notable. 
And I think that that's happening to some extent here in Northampton right now. I don't have my pulse, my finger on the pulse the way in my younger years when I used to do a lot of real estate closings as a sort of general practitioner lawyer, you know, and like in the 80s when there was a huge back, you know, pent up demand for starter houses and the interest rates were like 12, 13% and nobody was able to get a mortgage. Um, and then rates dropped and all of a sudden a lot of starter houses on the market and things got, came down. But uh, Council of Barge, when you talk about the term affordable housing, that has a meaning in the law and it has to do with, you know, percentage of, you know, affordability by those with a certain percentage of the mean income in the, in the region. Of course, we're in the Springfield region here. And so, um, you know, it, there's both, you know, uh, sort of a, an informal meaning of affordable, which I think we're talking about something that young, young families can afford or people who are, you know, heretofore have been um, excluded from the market could get into the market. Um, and then there's the technical term affordability that would go on in, on our inventory, inventory of affordable housing for the state. So, you know, it's all very confusing. I'd also point out that, you know, these are the kinds of changes that we can make so that when things turn, um, we do have a stock of smaller houses um, and less expensive, or houses that can become less expensive. Um, and, um, but there is a limited, uh, lim there are a limited number of things that we can actually do by ordinance uh, to really affect the, uh, the marketability of houses and the housing market generally. Uh, we're just gonna have to wait for a downturn. And, you know, and, you know, I will just tell you that I have a son who lives in the Seattle area and he and his wife are trying to buy a house. And, you know, and I'm not exaggerating, 800 square foot houses are going for between five and $600,000. And it's just, they can't afford that, there's no way. And, um, and every house that they look at has been going for 50, 60, 70, up to 100,000 over asking price, and they're just bidding wars. So I think that right now we're, you know, we're in a very difficult period and hopefully things will, will sort of adjust as time goes on. But these are the kinds of things that we can do to make us ready for when the market adjusts. Thank you very much, Attorney Sewell. Thank you, Attorney Sewell. Megan? Yeah, I just, I'm, I agree with all of that because um, we're just, we're at the mercy of these market forces. And um, yes, it's true that, you know, right, we do need to increase the housing stock. And right now, I mean, I don't see, I don't think there's very much in these um, two family by right ordinances that would incentivize a builder to build small and build cheap versus um, larger and more expensive because the, you know, the demand, there is still possibly temporary demand coming from people who are, you know, affluent, um, you know, urban refugees who, um, you know, during the COVID crisis are, you know, want a home out here in the country. Um, so that could change. Um, and, um, you know, may, maybe in a few years, the, the demand will be coming from more from families who need starter homes. Um, I don't know if the prices will ever fall to the 250, 300 range that people really, really need. But um, yeah, I just wanted to, I just feel like as a committee, we wouldn't really be serving our purpose if we didn't actually um, add a little bit of that to this recommendation. Like, you know, um, yeah, that there are, you know, obviously there are many, many things out of our control. Um, it's difficult to, as you say, with ordinances, um, well, some people debate whether or not actually adding energy efficient requirements will actually, you know, necessarily bumps up the prices for housing. But um, yeah, so that's just what I think. I, I feel like we can, Yes, we should recommend this because, um, yeah, overall it's, you know, 
it's it actually it, there is possibility of creating more housing, and so that's that's better than what it is now. But um, and also, but then the other two, um, I feel more comfortable having a kind of saying we recommend these because they actually address um, you know these impediments of, to fair housing choice and something that. Um, you know, like in the, I was still looking for the unlocking opportunities, housing. Um, and that actually will, you know, because this, these are ordinances, this ordinance will actually um, may generate more the building of smaller and and less expensive um, rentals. So anyway. Nope. Thank you, Megan. Councilor Nash. Um, so, you know, the two family it, by right is, is an interesting one where um, I, I do see that there are, it's, per, it's, it's, it's suggesting two scenarios and it's saying across the city that you, um, that you can create a two family or add another single family home if you have the space. But actually um, in terms of affordability and flexibility for the existing structure the two family is actually the preferred way to go. So the, the two family um, could be, it, it could be a large home that, you know, that, that, um, that uh, let's say a young family moves into and they use the first floor and then the second floor is rented out. You know, it, that, I'm picturing something more urban. Um, in, in a suburban area, it could be that they create another entrance that they subdivide part of a larger home that, and then as time goes on, you know, when the family grows, that the family can incorporate that part of the house if they wish or not. But that, but the thing is by sharing walls that um, that, that increases affordability and it increases efficiency and it also increases the flexibility of the structure itself. And that that's actually the piece that I'm most excited about with the two family ordinance. The, 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 the concept of adding another additional home um, or structure that, you know, because now, now we're talking about those, you know, what the, the 500, 600, $700,000 home. But if you're talking about a two family, you might be, adding a doorway, adding a room, adding a garage in, with an apartment above, with the room out above it that allows you to create um, the, the space to have an additional unit. And so um, this is all to say, if we wanted to weigh in on that aspect of it, that, that might be a place to go. Um, yeah, I agree with that, Councilor Nash. I think that's how we should, um kind of uh, that that should be how our our um, recommendations are structured like this particular aspect or this particular kind of um, how this would play out how it would this way this time how this would be implemented in this way would actually benefit um, marginalized populations defined as housing, secure, lower income, disabled, so, and, and BIPOC who are um, underrepresented as homeowners here, um, or overrepresented as runners. Um, okay. Nope. So that, yeah, so should we take, should we vote on that? Is, is that sound like it's? I don't know if that's something that needs to be voted on. Um... Um, Attorney Seawald, you heard all this, correct? I know. I did, but um, 
I, I'd like to hear a motion because this would be this is this is kind of what I'm looking for. I'm looking okay. for some direction on exactly how to put this report together and what I'm what I'm reporting for this committee. And so, if uh, you know, if Megan, if you want to put this into a motion, and then we can debate on a specific motion. I feel like Councilman Nash should. <laughs> You know, I, I let me okay. let me give it a shot. I okay. um, that that we um, that we make a recommendation because this is going to council. Um, this one, a particular one, is probably going to be a council on Thursday, I believe. So, right, Laura? Oh, she's muted. Unmute yourself, Laura. <laughs> yes, the two families on the agenda Thursday. Yes, yeah, so um, I recommend that that uh, our committee, using the um, the the lens of supporting people from marginalized communities, emphasize ask that council figure out a way to incentivize two family over the two family homes, two single family homes. That's my suggestion. <laughs> that's my that's my motion. Yep. Motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Discussion. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep, nope. Councillor Nash. Yeah, I'm not sure what that mechanism would be but that, um, that it, it will, I'm, I'm expecting some lively discussion about all of this on the council floor and that, um, uh, that making a recommendation like who, who knows, it, I, to come up with the particulars of how to incentivize the two family over the two single families, I think we would need, you know, either, uh, uh, Wayne or Carolyn to help craft the language. Um, right. Oh, we do have attorney C. Oh, attorney Seawald here, though. I think. Oh, Megan. I actually don't think we need to worry about that. I, I'm, this committee doesn't need to worry about that. I mean, we just make a broad recommendation. Can you hold on a second? Thank you. And um, lots of interruptions today. Um, so just, we don't need to figure out a particulars because we're not here to craft ordinances. We really are not. Um, but simply that it would be more, it would be more beneficial for, you know, renters and those seeking to, um, to get into the housing market to, if it was implemented this way. And then, you know, that's just, so having our recommendations on that level, I think we, we're fine. And, whether, and we're not affecting whether or not these ordinances go into effect. Any other members? So, Councilman Nash, you look like you're gonna say something. Well, so did my motion sound like what member Peck just said? <laughs> Because <laughs> that's, I, I think we're in agreement, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Attorney Seawald. I'm interested in hearing what the committee has to say. <laughs> and, you know, the, the truth is, if we're going to incentivize two families as opposed to two individual small, uh, if I'm understanding the motion, we would prefer, the committee would prefer incentivizing two families as opposed to two separate structures. Right. Is that right? Yes. Interesting. And, but however, understand that two families could be two four bedroom and the two separate structures, if we're doing half units are going to be limited in size. Mm -hmm. So my concern and, and so um, you know, the, the prohibition against regulating the size of dwellings applies to single family dwellings. 
So if you're encouraging going to two family, perhaps there ought to be also encouragement to limit the size of two families. Now, all of this is not something, and I, and I agree with Megan on this point, is not something that this committee is going to do between now and the end of the month. And the reason I say that is that, um, you know, this takes study, this takes thought, this takes crafting of, of ordinances, and that's what the planning department is for. But, but what we're um, um, encouraging is amendments to zoning that would incentivize smaller two-family houses, smaller two-family units, and understanding that without these incentives, um, smaller lots or some you know, less frontage, without these incentives, understand that the great profit center is in the larger, in the increasing size of the building because you're still putting in two kitchens, you're still putting in X number of bathrooms, you're just making rooms larger. And that's where um, builders get a lot of profit. And so we need to incentivize them to do something that is against their economic interest. How exactly to do that is not something that anybody who's sitting here right now is going to be able to, um, you know, sp specify. Okay. Any, uh, Councilor Nash. So Attorney Seawall, did you just shoot my motion down? <laughs> I don't get a vote. Uh, uh, no, I, I think that, that incentivizing um, smaller two families is, is something that this committee could uh, rationally uh, recommend. I'm not telling you that's what you should recommend. I'm just saying that, that, uh, that just recommending two families in a single structure as, to, as opposed to, to the smaller individual structures might actually um, not be really consistent with what you're trying to do because of the possibility of building really large two families, you know, four bedrooms on each side. That would defeat the whole purpose. Yeah. And I have Unless say you're trying, you know, to get, you know, large families, larger low income families, then let's not forget that not everybody can live in a 900 square foot house. And so that there are larger low income families who need places to live and they do need larger units. This is all a balance here that I really can't tell you how to balance these things. But, you know, um, it, you know we're not a monolithic society and, you know, the, the marginalized communities are, mo are not monolithic any more than any other community is other than being marginalized. Yeah, but we, we know that, um, I, mean, I, I would never want to generalize like simply because they're lower income, they would prefer smaller houses. That's probably not true. They would need more affordable housing um, that's safe and all of that. But, um, I, you know, I agree with you. The problem is that the costs go up with size. And so, yeah, it is a, it is a balancing act. And I, you know, if we just want to, we may not even need to say um, should incent these ordinances need to build in some kind of incentive for you know them to for people to build two for two families versus not. I mean, I don't even we could even pull back from that a bit and just say this would be better for <laughs> lower income families or. Um, and, and it may not be possible in the next few years, you know, until I know interest rates fall and, you know, plus demand for um, when people to move here and buy houses with cash and I don't know. So anyway, yeah. The problem is that interest rates have very little room to fall at this point. They're extremely low. Building I mean, materials are very expensive. And you know we 
you know, we had an administration that put tariffs on Canadian lumber and increased the price of lumber. I mean, all of this affects the, the cost of houses. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we do know from previous studies that there is a dearth of actually housing with more than two bedrooms here. So, you know, you can mention that as well, but um, yeah, so that's, yeah, I, we, we feel you like- know, per, per, Perhaps what, what you're urging is for the city council to study ways that we can incentivize lower cost housing in the city. I mean, the city council can form ad hoc committees and actually, you know, do these kinds of, uh, do this work that we, you know, but um, you're identifying a problem for the city council to work on to create zoning ordinances that would, as I said, incentivize lower cost housing. And, you know, you do that by allowing larger portions of the lot to be covered, smaller lots, less frontage, um, you know, things that offset the loss on the other end of, from building larger houses. So you get more lots, but, but the problem is we're already doing a lot of these things. We actually have very innovative zoning and we have very, uh, a, a very innovative and um, forward thinking planning department. And so, you know, you're, what you're experiencing is the, the, um, the limits of our ability through ordinances to really impact these market forces, particularly in a community that's very attractive, not, you know, even before COVID, people wanted to move to Northampton and were we're willing to pay more than a community of this size would normally warrant. I mean, you know, um, you know, Chicopee is not a place, you know, that people are paying the kind of prices because people don't want to move to Chicopee the way people want to move to Northampton. And, um, you know, and there are a lot of other similarly sized communities where that's true. And so we're paying the penalty for being an attractive place to live an attractive place to raise families, and now even worse, an attractive place to get refuge from the cities during a pandemic. And, you know, I don't know how much we're gonna be able to do in this committee or even the city council can do to change those dynamics mm -hmm. other than make Northampton a less attractive place to live. Um, the other thing is of course that you have um, students yeah. who are coming here every year and they, they have more money than the marginalized community, mm -hmm. you know, have as a general, as a generalization and their ability, they're, they're able to rent places out from under uh, more marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why I said, this is another intractable problem. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, right. I I agree, and I, I was going to make that other point as well, that um, students, you know, particularly Smith College students, but also a lot of five, just generally graduates of, like, from the five colleges are uh, renters in our town. And they are probably part of that, part of the data of renters. And if we, we should probably exclude them from our, our discussion. And that sort of when we contextualize, like, you know, we need to exclude them from the sort of our um, our definition of of marginalized um, populations, because you know, students they have other they have access to other resources and opportunities that struggling families will not. Um, so um, that is, uh, and we could probably see more starkly. I'm I'm just forecasting if we were to do another analysis, data just how much more starkly. Um, people who are BIPOC um, tend to be um, disproportionate renters in this town. Um, and uh, people who might are more recent immigrants and everything you might expect. But, you know, they are, yeah, they're, we are in this college town and like most of them, we have, you know, it's what keeps our housing 
market stable and um, rents and you know having the students have one students probably are part of the reasons our, our rents are high um, so because there's that constant demand that say uh, for um, nice housing so anyway yeah I uh, do do you feel like um, how much of this do you feel like you could kind of add to our recommendation um, I I don't think it's. I actually... think it's more of an observation than a recommendation. I mean, I haven't heard recommendations that I can that I, I I can put into language to the city council to pass ordinances, and you know I, I know I'm harping on keeping on focus on ordinances, but I think this is background, and um, you know, and I think that this committee can call on the city council to pass ordinances that help these communities afford to live in Northampton. But I'm not really sure that this committee is going to really define what those ordinances are. And so I, I see this more as background um, mm -hmm. than you know, specific recommendations. And so if we were to get back to uh, the spreadsheet of the ordinances that are really before this committee, and you know, I think that's important to you know, fill in the uh, the committee action on some of these ordinances that you've already considered, and you know. So I would in, encourage us to to get back to that discussion so that I have you know I I don't want this to be the shortest report of all time, um, and be more aspirational than actually. Um, and you know, we have some ordinances here that I think can be helpful. And um, uh, so. So, Chief Family, if I write, it's actually on this spreadsheet. And right. We are talking about our committee action. Um, our right. So, we're going to, you know, by the, if, if in fact this is going to be on the agenda at the next city council meeting, by the time this report is filed, that will also already be in the, um, in the zoning ordinance, and, and we can, um, inf you know, inform the city council that this is something that was supported, and it's it's the kind of uh, amendment that, if properly, that with others, if properly targeted, can solve this problem. So mm -hmm. I think I have direction on what to do by two family by right, um, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, for instance, liberalize, liberalizing residential in Florence Center and downtown, um, that's also in drafting stage. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's something that, that um, uh, Wayne Feiden presented back in November and you haven't taken a position on that. And maybe, you know, the two family by right, it's already gonna, you know, I can already predict that that's gonna be in the zoning ordinance by the time we, um, we write this this report and get it finalized. Uh, so I, I understand the background effort to liberalize housing regulations so that it opens, opens literally and figuratively opens the door to these communities. Um, but you know what I was hoping was that I would get more direction on, you know, we keep going and get more direction on these other ordinances that are still hanging out there that you haven't um, decided what to say about um, so that I can start drafting this this uh, this week. And no, I didn't, I, I didn't undermine your motion. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to say. Councilor <laughs> Nash. Yeah, so what I think I want to do is um, based on uh, what attorney Seawald just shared uh, is to withdraw my motion to uh, make a recommendation. I think that um, rather let's make a recommendation to council through our report to explore uh, ways to incentivize in affordable housing through, um, through our ordinances. And, and, Council planning and the mayor's office to all work together 
to find ways to incentivize uh, housing for marginalized communities. Yeah. That sounds How's good. That? I'll second that motion. And I don't think we need a motion for that, right? I don't know. Can't, can, Attorney Seawald, you're muted. Did, I didn't hear that. <laughs> do, do we need that motion? He's about to say. I, I, I think that that's gonna come through as we go through uh, not only two family by right, but li liberalizing residential in Florence, the local comprehensive permit ordinance. I think that is going to be what's underlying all of your uh, recommendations on these ordinances. So I don't think we need a separate motion on that. Right. If the committee is inclined to do, you know, to have a motion in that regard, I don't, it, it's fine. But I, I think that that's going to, as I say, underlie all of your, uh, your approach to all of these ordinances. Well, as somebody who's uh, supportive of Member Peck's uh, 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 desire to have a narrative, I would like to have language to that effect part of the narrative. And okay. just make note of that for when we pull that together. So I've withdrawn my motion, right? So now we're good. And then Megan needs to withdraw her second, right? Yes. Megan? Yeah, so um, I think what we have to term bucket three ordinances might be ready for um, this discussion. Uh, last time, or last meeting, we lost a couple of members, so um, we didn't get fully complete. Um, I feel like we didn't um, uh, flesh out how what we're going to do about the Northampton ho uh, Housing Partnerships um, proposed um, Housing Stability Notification Act. So maybe we can go through these like one by one in order and just decide what the committee's pleasure is on how to address these in the report, what your position is on these. Yeah. Laura, can you pull that up? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's go through. Is everyone okay reading it on their own? Do you want me to read each one, one by one? Yep. Okay, so on the first one, we have the Northampton Housing Partnership. That's the proposer. The ordinance reviewed is the Housing Stability Notification Ordinance Purpose Discussion requires landlords of rental units or people foreclosing on a house to give tenants a list of financial and legal resources when serving a notice to quit, such as residential assistance for families in transition and, um, Raft and emergency rental and mortgage assistance, IRMA. Ordinance review committee action, presentation by community development planner Keith Benoit on November 17, 2020, under development by Northampton Housing Partnership. Similar ordinances have been enacted in Cambridge and Somerville. That's what we have. Yes, and if I recall, uh, Attorney Seawald had reservations about our ability to do this in ordinance. Isn't that, isn't that correct? I have some reservations, but I don't think my reservations should be a reason not to go forward. I don't think this is clearly outside of uh, the city council's ability to pass an ordinance. And uh, as I said, if the only um, risk is that it will be struck down by a judge, I can live with that risk. What I don't want is uh, you know, to violate people's rights um, and put the city at risk of, of damages. So, um, hmm. so does that mean that we're recommending it? Do we want to? I think a motion needs to be made. You know, as to what the committee wants to do with this. Well, are we are we recommending it in as? stated on the draft form that he presented us with in November, um, because I, I haven't seen a more recent iteration of it, but um, I remember there were, um, he had a, you know, he thought there were already a couple of issues 
with it, um, with enforcement piece of it. Like there wasn't an agency that seemed like it would be um, appropriate to um, track and impose that fining of the $500 of non-compliant landlords. And so we had, um, and I feel like this would be a ordinance that would be really good to put through the, to organize in the way that um, I did for the, the snow, snow emergency ordinance as well, because um, uh, we, um, we, we discussed possibly like um, alleviating the cost of that, the burden of that to landlords by having um, the information about legal and financial resources be um, disseminated by another entity, like a nonprofit or if not, you know, uh, probably with um, in partnership with a, one of our volunteer boards, the HRC or the, the housing partnership. Um, but, um, Yes, and to that end, Member Peck, I, so uh, community resources back, oh, when was it? We, we had, um, I, I guess it was our January meeting. Uh, we had, we featured um, uh, housing uh, security and, um, and, and while setting people up, I was asking around with community action to see if they would be willing to take the lead on that. Um, they, uh, the, the, the folks I were talk, was talking with, they were kind of like, well, they, mm. but I think what we're really talking about is really just like an information folder that, mm. you know, that can be online, that some, that at the time of signing a lease that somebody is made aware that this folder is there, it's recommended that you go there, it's going to, you know, advise you of your different rights here. And, you know, and then it can be up on a site somewhere. You know, I, I don't want to commit the city to it, but it, it maybe it could be, you know, the housing partnership webpage mm -hmm. that, you know, we're, we're talking about basic information that, you know, people could just click on and there it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I would want to, oh, sorry. What, um, Member Napolitano. Yeah. I mean, uh, no, I was just going to say that I, I'm not sure how that would even, how that would work necessarily because leases aren't, I don't think that they're, they're kept by, uh, on file with the city. And so we, we have this problem of like not being able to identify either landlords nor renters. Um, but then the other question to me is, or the issue is, um, do we necessarily want to wade into the weeds and determine whether or not it's implementable in order to simply say to the city council, this something to this effect is ne it would be something that's beneficial in Northampton and just leaving it at that. Totally support that. And I think that we're, I, I, I just, I think that we need to recommend the kinds of ordinances that the city council can pass. Um, and leave it to the city council to figure out the, the you know, the details, because mm -hmm. the devil is in the details of all of these things, and we will never get through these if we're going to, you know, decide the the, the minutia of all of this. Okay. Okay. So we could so, just. So do we want to make a motion on this particular one to, to talk about? Um, what Attorney Seawald was just recommending. Yes. <laughs> yes. Can we hear motion? It supports uh, tenant tenant education. I think that was just missing. Uh, uh, so that's yeah. And so we can. Okay. Um, Let the council I, actually about whether or not going to find landlords or who's going to enforce that finding. Okay. All right. So I think I have a motion then. So I'm going to make a motion that, uh, that 
this particular that the housing stability notification ordinance uh, get further exploration from city council uh, around the issue of uh, tenant notification and information. I'll second that one, Councillor. Can I make a friendly amendment to the motion? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Just, just, just to say that um, uh, that we recommend the the aim of the of this particular um, ordinance that's been implemented. I mean, specifically, I think naming the, the fact that this this has been implemented or, or begun to be implemented in in Boston and in Somerville, and that um, it would benefit the city of Northampton. We believe it would benefit the city of Northampton. Did you get all that, Laura? I mean, just like how, and it's that that's particularly timely during this eviction crisis. Um, and that there's a dearth of um, tenant education. Mm -hmm. And they can figure out how to. You, know, you haven't seen a you haven't seen an eviction crisis and you won't see an eviction crisis until the moratorium is lifted, and then you're going to have a major eviction crisis. Mm -hmm. It's coming, yeah. and so this is a great idea that the that, that the city council explore a housing stability notification ordinance so that tenants are informed of their rights at the same time. But it should be pegged to the notice to quit. It should be pegged to the the eviction process, not to the leasing process. I heard a motion. I heard an amended motion. It is seconded. Um, any further discussion? Well, I just want to make sure Laura's got the motion. Yeah, there. let me try to. So, Councillor Nash's motion was that the housing stability notification ordinance get further exploration from the city council around the issue of tenant notification and information. And then I think a member Napolitano's friendly amendment was that it be named that this ordinance has been implemented in Somerville and Boston and that it would be useful in Northampton. I kind of maybe missed the end of his statement. It should be Cambridge, Cambridge and Somerville. Okay, Cambridge. Can, 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 I, can I just step in and, and tell you what would be helpful to me in drafting this? Just a motion to adopt a tenant notification ordinance similar to Somerville in Boston to educate tenants at, during the eviction process. Simple. I will be able to, you know, elaborate on why you want to do that, but the, just, just what we need to do is vote on what you would like the city council to do. And uh, just in very simple terms. Did you get that, Laura? Yes, as, as long as the motion maker and second accept that as a friendly amendment. That sounds was, great. <laughs> I agree. Okay. Or I leave a roll call on the. Okay. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. Okay, one moving down. <laughs> moving on to number two, which is proposed by the planning department, two family by right in all residential districts, introduced to city council December 17, 2020 as package of ordinances relative to two family by right. Purpose discussion, allow two families by right in all residential zoning districts, including two detached single family structures, Ordinance Review Committee action presented by Office of Planning and Sustainability, <coughs> Director Wayne Fiden, November 2nd, 2020, as part of current zoning initiatives intended to address barriers to fair housing, in parentheses, decision made January 11th, 2021, to include in bucket number three. Yep. Discussion. Uh, Councilor Nash. Well, I, I believe this falls under what we discussed further or earlier about it. And I think we're going to see this with like two or three others here mm -hmm. <laughs> that we encourage council to explore um, 
options around affordability for marginalized uh, communities. Yeah. So I think we already figured that out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. done. Alan, do we need to do a motion on that for you or no? <coughs> He's muted, okay. I think we're, we're all set with that. Okay. Cool. And next, oh, next I see is the planning department again, liberal, liberalizing residential in Florence Center and downtown and drafting stage at time of presentation. Allow residential uses on the first floor of commercial buildings outside core downtown areas to allow more people to live within walking distance, allow property owners more options and create housing opportunities at all levels of the market. Presented by the Office of Planning and Sustainability, Director Wayne Fighting on November 2nd, 2020. Council Nash, I believe that we're all set with this one. Is this similar? And is this something that the, the committee wants to support? I don't know that we've discussed that you've discussed this. I think we did did get to it. In December or something like that, and we did have we a, did? some okay. discussion it, about it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's not in the ordinance committee ordinance review committee action. Or oh, the, the last thing in the action column, the fourth column, is uh, that it was presented. So, Laura, if, if there was a motion on this and it was um, supported or whatever the motion was, could you fill that in? Yeah, I don't believe that there was. I don't think so either. I don't think we've ever discussed any of these. I think we've taken in a lot of information, but not a lot of decisions have been made. So members, is this something we would like to recommend to the council? Councilor Nash. I, I would um, support um, this going with the other zoning ordinances around housing. Um, I mean, this, this is, think, you know, trying to come up with ways to expand, um, you know, first foot. I mean, so in terms of our, um, where we have a lot of vacancies around town, it, it, it is a lot of first floor retail. And while I don't want to see uh, first floor retail on Main Street be used for residential, but I think that there's other places around the city where, you know, that having a shift there, um, especially the, for there's first floor retail that's gone vacant for quite a while. And it might just be, you know, to add some flexibility around that, I think would be an effective um, change to make. Um, particularly with the the idea that eventually it, it it allows the property owner to go back to commercial if they choose um it it just doesn't it, it um that to have a a commercial space empty is the property owner's not making any money off of that so if they can make some income off of renting it out as residential space um it makes sense to me. Excuse me, members, I need to excuse myself. I have a family emergency. So um, I'm going to continue recording the meeting and just turn off my camera and my microphone. I've just received a text, um, so I must go. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, no. Nope. Hope it works out well. Mm. Um, I mean, great. Before we go any further, Attorney Seawald. Yes. Quick question. How does this move forward now with Laura gone? I mean, who um, roll calls and motions and um, 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 so I just want to, yeah. there's some confusion here. So if we have to call the meeting just in case, I just want to make sure we're not moving forward and we're missing a whole lot. Yeah, of somebody's <laughs> going to have to do roll call votes because all virtual meetings require all votes to be roll call. Um, so. I'll do it. Okay. Go, Jeff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm fine with adding this 
you know, <laughs> putting this in the same group as the other. <coughs> I agree. So <coughs> there is, okay. So we'll do a, we need a. Well, do we need a vote on that? We do need to vote because we didn't vote the last okay. time. Yeah. Right. Just in so case I'll we... make a motion that we include this with the other uh, zoning ordinances dealing with um, housing. I have second that. Okay, motion made by Councilor Nash, seconded by Councilor Barge. Uh, roll call, please, Jeff. All right, uh, Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. Member Napolitano. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Okay, so. That was really well done. Well, right. good, good job, good job. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna go straight down the list because I don't have the, um, the screen up, but the next on the list is the another from the planning department. And this is for ordinance reviewed was the introduction of a local comprehensive, comprehensive permit ordinance, parentheses in conceptual phase at time of presentation, introduced to city council February 4th, 2021 as item 20.181, an ordinance relative to affordable housing, section 350-6-12, allow the affordable housing that is allowed under the state's comprehensive permit law with the same process, but less paperwork than the date I'm sorry, then the state process presented by Office of Planning and Sustainability Director Biden on November 2nd, 2020, the same date that we just recommended regarding the um, liberalizing residential. So, Councilor Nash. I would like to make a motion that we include this with our um, residential housing recommendations. And I'm gonna second that one. Okay, that motion made by Councilor Nash, seconded by Councilor Labarge. And I believe we need to roll call. Roll call. <laughs> Jeff. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano is a yes. <laughs> Passes unanimously. Let me just look here. My apologies. It looks like there's another line here. Like it's, there's a separate line or maybe it's all part of that first one we just voted on that says requiring rental agency fees to be paid by landlords instead of tenants. No. Does anyone see this, that? Yeah, yes. this was a yeah. different proposed ordinance that we discussed and I've informed you that it's my opinion that the city council does not have the authority to do this. Okay. And it was, I don't know who brought it to the committee. Okay. But I don't believe that, that the, uh, and I will note that it was brought to the committee and that, that under the supervision of, of the city solicitor, the, the committee got the opinion that this was not within the uh, authority of the, of the city council to enact. So, um, okay. uh, unless, unless the committee has a different view and wants to go forward with that anyway, um, that's what I would propose. Megan? It might have been Carmen Juno when she came. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So we won't, uh, no, that won't be, okay. I'm gonna move on next to the request by Bo Clark on November 30th and November 18th by Tate Porco email, the fair chance ordinance request to create and pass a fair chance ordinance that limits the use of criminal record by private landlords. Members reviewed national housing law project fair chance ordinance toolkit on November 17, 2020 meeting. Among other things, the toolkit included a caveat that fair chance ordinances usually comes from the work of groups organizations. Consensus was that this is not something ordinance review commission equipped to do. Northampton housing project member, Carmen Juno proposed consideration of a sole exclusion of eviction history. 
refer to bucket number two, November 30th, 2020. Okay. Megan. Well, first of all, it should be bucket number three because it's non-existing um, ordinance. But um, yeah, I thought you decided it wasn't appropriate for Northampton. Um, I looked for that toolkit and it requires to, it's really, it's really, um, I mean, there's no, it's no surprise. It's an active place like Richmond, Seattle, DC and New York because places with large housing departments um, because this requires someone to handle the, we don't administrative complaint process that we here have to um, refer to MCAD so we don't have that capability here in Northampton right now. Um, so that's just, we could actually add that to our recommendation to not support this at this time. Okay. And Mr. Chair, also, I, I believe we had a discussion that the Corey statute, the criminal offender record information statute was specifically amended at the state level to give uh, access to landlord to that information. And I don't believe that we could, I think that, that the state legislature has spoken in this regard. Um, that's not to say anything about the exclusion of eviction history, but um, uh, I, I don't know how we would prevent landlords from at least going to uh, courts and looking at records of evictions in courts, their public records. Right. So I, I just don't see how we could do this. Right, but I isn't mean, that something though we, we could put in the our, um, report that we did review this and that this is, I think that's what we wanna say regarding this item. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll be sure to do that. Do we need to, or do you, is this something that we need to do a motion on Attorney Seawall Vincent to you? Um, yeah, I think that a motion would be okay. appropriate. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? A motion to not recommend a fair chance ordinance in Northampton at this time. Motion made by Member Peck, Second. seconded by. I'll second. let Jeff do it. Let Jeff do it. Seconded, <laughs> seconded by Jeff Napolitano. Thank you. Roll call, please. Uh, Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Lavarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano is a yes. Okay. Next up, present by Councilor Nash, proposal to expand notification under Section 350-3.5, whereas expand notification of zoning map changes to include tenants of abutting properties as well as owners. Sent to planning board for review and comment, December 7, 2020. Parentheses members decided to place in bucket number three, January 11th, 2021. Okay. And, and I can, just a little follow-up information there. I That Carolyn and I are scheduling for the March 11th planning board meeting to discuss this in another matter that um, is on here. Um, oh, I think it has the next one. Yeah, this and the next one. Uh, we're, we're gonna just discuss um, uh, with the planning board to see if we can come up with any creative ideas to uh, better inform stuff uh, folks so that um, maybe, oh, maybe an ordinance isn't required in this particular situation. Maybe it could be something that happens on the administrative side, uh, which is something we discussed with Attorney Seawald when we were talking about this last time. So um, I guess we need a motion. A motion to uh, council to uh, continue exploring ways to increase uh, notification about zoning changes. I'll second that. Do you want to just def defer this until after the planning board has had a chance to look at it? I mean, that was what we were waiting for. Was yeah, so the only thing is I, I, 
if I don't make that meeting for some reason, or it doesn't happen in March, that I, I just don't want to see our. Um, oh, okay. Or, or we could, I mean, we're going to meet again and we could just quickly go back to it. Why don't we do that? What do we want to do? Um, why don't I withdraw the, the, the motion and for the next two, they're going to be before planning board for discussion and we'll come back to those um, before uh, at one of our next meetings. Okay, so before I move forward, so the one year proposal to expand notification under three, uh, section 350-3.5, yep. the, the next one with Councillor Foster 312-51 towing of vehicles impeding snow removal operations. And the next one with Councillor Alex Jarrett, commercial buffer zone proposal. Those should be deferred. Or you're asking for those to be deferred? You know what? Uh, that uh, Councillor Jarrett, that one, um, let's discuss that uh, separately. Okay. So the two that we're going to defer is the one with for you and the one with Councillor Foster. Correct. Okay. I think we need a, do we need a motion to defer those today? So I'll Not make for my motion. purposes. Nope. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So next up we have Councillor Alex Jarrett, commercial buffer zone proposal. There is no specific text proposed. Table December 15, 2020 for further research by Councillors Nash and Jarrett. Councillors to research who has enforcement responsibility and clarify whether CB and medical districts are considered residential for purposes of enforcement. Yeah, so what I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to ask for us to uh, uh, put off a consideration of that one at this time, um, that, that we do have some information here, but um, there's a little more research to do. Okay. Let's move on next to Tay Porco, presentation of demand made and created by unhoused organizers and people. Excerpt from Tay Porco's email dated November 18, 2020, Northampton must create an ordinance banning the selling of public lands and buildings gifted to the city to private developers immediately. There is no excuse for lack of affordable housing when buildings are gifted to the city for public use. Buildings gifted must be turned into affordable housing first and foremost before any other potential sales. The human right to shelter comes before capital investments. I am talking about the mayor's decision to sell the Florence Grammar School, the South Street School, the old water department building and the current public ownership and potential sale of 593 Elm Street building in parentheses, in addition to many buildings gifted in the last 10 to 15 years under different supervision. At December 15, 2020 meeting, members discussed that this is not an accurate statement, but seems to reflect a misperception. In almost every sale he's been involved with in the eight years he served as city solicitor, there has been some public benefit or community need the city is trying to fill. Attorney Seawall confirmed, a lot of these buildings are not set up for people to live in. They weren't residences when the city was using them and are not residences now the cost of renovating the buildings to provide sanitary facilities, et cetera, to turn these into houses would be financially prohibitive. Note also, in all cases mentioned by Tay, properties were not gifted, gifted to the city, but were municipal buildings no longer in use. List of demands from the unhoused organizers referred to bucket number two, November 30th, 2020. Okay. Discussion. Mr. Nash. Well, I'd like to make a motion that we do not recommend action on this at this time. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Okay, can I get a... Roll call, please. Jim. Is there just discussion? Oh, wait a Sorry yeah, about that. Just so um, the 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 premise of this was not 
accurate, right? So there's no um, buildings gifted to the city or gifted to private developers, right? Can, can I address that? Yes, turn um, to see. Th there have been uh, buildings that were uh, quote unquote, not, not gifted, but uh, uh, provided at favorable um, rates. For instance, the Survival Center. Um, that building, I don't know if you remember what it used to look like, uh, but the Survival Center, and I, I will disclose that I, at the time I was the president of the Survival Center board, so I know a lot about this, um, has a very favorable lease, long-term lease on that building because we put a, a ton of money into completely rebuilding it and turning it into what it is today. Uh, same with the, um, the the music center, and I will disclose that I was on the on the committee that decided what should be done with the South Street School way back when Claire Higgins was uh, mayor. And so, um, you know, these are buildings that were in disrepair that were repurposed for things that the city at that time thought were uh, needs that needed to be filled in our community. Um, the Florence Community Center is the only building that I've been involved with that was just literally sold for commercial purposes. That's the only one that I've been involved with. Uh, every other one has been, uh, number one, restricted for some positive community use. Um, and, um, you know, uh, you know, there obviously have been before, you know, the, the old South, the South School Street Commons or whatever they're called, those big condos right at the corner of Route 9 and South Street were sold in the early mid 80s uh, for condos. But since that time, I have not been involved in any sale of buildings uh, or gift of buildings for less than something approaching market value. Councilor Nash. Yeah, and I just want to add around the Florence Community Center uh, that it, it was no longer being used for, the, for city purposes. There was a bit of time where there was a school program that was in the building, uh, but then, uh, then that program was moved back to the high school and it was largely being rented out as commercial space that uh, for a lot of nonprofits, but there was a web developer in there. There was, um, there was an opera company in there and that when it was sold, it was the city shouldn't be in the business of, of operating commercial property. And that's, it was sold to somebody to continue operating it in that fashion. That, that's my understanding, correct, Attorney Seawalt? That is, that is correct. Okay. But I think that the, the bottom line here is that none of these buildings were appropriate to put people in to live. That's why we're proceeding with our attempt to establish a resiliency hub where we can house, you know, houseless people in particularly in emergency situations. Um, but you know the building. You know we can't just put people in buildings and expect them to live in, in you know, in inappropriate buildings. We, we have sanitary codes and things like that. Any further discussion? Uh, like, I don't. Jeff. No, I just I, I don't. I, I, so there was once a prestigious nonprofits um, known as the American Rent Service Committee that was in the building in Florence. Um, and I'm not sure um, that I necessarily understand the argument about not being able to put people who are experiencing houselessness uh, or homelessness in, in a space that has, you know, hot water and heat in it. <clears throat> Why is that? Why is that not appropriate? Because we're providing housing that is not housing, and it doesn't have the facilities. I mean, it, it might, and you might have a, a particular location that could have been used, but 
You know, the survival center is not in a space that could have been used as is for housing. They were garages. And, um, and I just don't think that, that uh, um, we could have put people in these spaces for any long-term uh, use without renovating them. But it could have been like short-term use or something like that, right? Possibly, but uh, certainly was not. They were they were not set up for for housing. Okay. Any anything else? Any? I think the general concern was that there, there's not that priority to to first use buildings. I mean, open space. I mean, of course, all buildings need to be renovated for them to be, you know, safe and sanitary uh, for people. But yeah, I, I'm not sure if this. I'm not sure if this is pertinent to the. To the motion at hand, just um, when we're talking about you know people who are you know have no shelter and are living in the cold and saying that something would require renovation when everything requires renovation and and there certainly was it was certainly better would be better than living in the cold. I'm just not, I'm not sure. I'm I think that that's necessarily a valid argument, but I don't think that's that, that's necessarily relevant to this motion. So. I don't but, really but what we're talking about is prohibiting the city from selling any buildings. And yeah, you know, the other thing I will point out with ordinances like this, and I pointed this out with ordinances like the sale of the water system and um, other ordinances, uh, you, if you can get five votes to pass this ordinance and the city council decides it wants to sell a building, you can get the same five votes to sell the, to, to repeal the ordinance and sell the building. Um, you know, these, you're trying to prohibit future city councils for do, from doing something that the same vote, quantum of vote, can vote to do, despite the ordinance. These ordinances have, you know, are in some ways ineffective um, because um, city council can always sell, the, sell a building. All it needs to do is to vote to sell the building. I mean, but in repeal an ordinance vote. beforehand. Of course, of course. Isn't that so literally true of every ordinance? Sell though? the water system. Well, but but not every ordinance tries to bind future city councils from doing something. Mostly, ordinances prevent citizens and private people from doing things. It regulates the conduct of private people, not the conduct of future city councils. Zoning doesn't doesn't bind future city councils on how we develop land. It 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 regulates how people develop land. Private citizens develop land. Parking isn't about what the city council does in the future. It's what private citizens do. So I'm just saying that they they feel good and they might have some inhibiting effect, but they're just they're not like regular ordinances that binds citizens and citizens can't change it on their own. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I just wanna add one thing about Tay's request here and it was to create affordable housing and that it, it wasn't to create a shelter for uh, people who are houseless right now. And so I, I, I think that that's, that's what I'm speaking to here and I mean, where does it say? Uh, must be turned into affordable housing first and foremost before any other potential sales. Now, um, if there were a surplus building uh, downtown that were available right now to provide shelter, I'm sure that the mayor's office and the council would be all for figuring out a way of like, oh, we have an empty building. Let's, let's use that during this, this crisis right now. You look skeptical, Jeff. I am very skeptical. Why? Well, I will tell you that you know this resiliency. How we are, we are and have been working on 
on finding building for, it's not an existing city building, but we are working on it. And, it, and uh, you know, I'm not really, we're in some negotiations right now that I'm not at liberty to speak about publicly yet, but, you know, it's not something we're doing nothing about. And, I will, cool. also, <laughs> and I will also point out that, you know, we have, you know, advanced affordable housing, not necessarily in city owned buildings, but, you know, we've just helped uh, by providing funding through mechanisms that we have for two four story buildings in downtown on Pleasant Street for affordable housing. And, you know, while we can't take complete credit for it, we worked hard and I worked hard along with the developers of that affordable housing to make sure that that happened. And we got, you know, grant funding to them and took an affordable housing restriction on those buildings so that we can maintain them as affordable housing. So I just want to go on record to say that, that you know, Wayne has worked very hard to, uh, to get affordable housing into our community and we have maintained and this is, this is a very low bar and I'll grant you that. But we have always been over the 10% that the state requires of every community. And, um, and we you know, assiduously um, work toward that end because it gives us a lot more flexibility to do things with regard to affordable housing um, if we're over the 10% and we're not subject to the state comprehensive permit law that, um, that, that is difficult for local citizens. So we've stayed over the 10%. And I think we've worked pretty hard uh, to the best we can, but it's hard to convince non companies that aren't like wayfinders uh, to do affordable housing because they can make money and you need nonprofits to do this. And I think that we've worked hard with nonprofits. Peg Keller worked hard with nonprofits. And, you know, so I just want to be on record about that. And I will point out that the big buildings that went down and you know up in downtown North and uh, downtown Amherst are not affordable housing. Uh, they're really expensive housing in the large buildings in Amherst. Councilor Nash. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that um, that you know as a counselor, I heard a lot of concern about people being houseless downtown and that, um, that um, and I know that the mayor's office worked like crazy to uh, work with, uh, what was it, ServiceNet to open up the, the shelter at First Churches. And that, um, and that there, I mean, what we're talking about here is, is there surplus space available with city off, with city space to make available for this? And um, that I, you know, I maybe in retrospect we could consider opening up City Hall or, or um, uh, you know, or as such and turn it into a space. But um, you know, but a, a shelter needs to have, and that's part of what it went into the planning for the the site at the first churches that it needs to have the the sanitary stuff it needs to have water it needs to have heat and, and and also it needs to be set up so people can socially distance and all of that so because of the pandemic so um um anyway thank you Catherine nash um any other discussion? Do we hear a motion to refer this or the motion to not refer this to council with an explanation? I think there is a motion pending. Is it? Maybe yeah, I I think I made, didn't I make a motion to? Not to recommend this to council okay. at this time. Okay. Paul. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. Member Napolitano is a yes. Okay. Moving on. 
List of demands verbally presented on November 17, 2020, Ordinance Review Committee meeting. Request to immediately legalize temporary structures and tents in public and repeal all camping ordinances. Uh, December 15, 2020, Councilor Nash reported that his review of ordinances did not find any ordinance prohibiting camping on city property. There are prohibitions against camping on city conservation property. As far as he knows, there is nothing on the books prohibiting camping in public space. Referred to bucket number two on November 30th, 2020. I hear a motion. So for the sake of discussion, I'll make a motion that we not refer this to council at this time. And, um, but we're gonna discuss, so. <laughs> right here, a second. Second. Okay, discussion. Yeah, so the, the reason I wanna, uh, th that I'm recommending that is that, um, that th the, I, I think that um, the advocates came to us with a list of of possible ordinances to address with a you know uh, with the fill in the blank this city and that I think they did that in this case and that we don't we don't have um, regulations um, uh, around camping on you know city parks or anything like that and that i'm not encouraging that but that um, we we don't have those there is on conservation property around town that um that it's supposed to be used passively and that um and that's true of everybody it's consistent so that um uh so you know those are the regulations around conservation um, and, and I believe I said during that meeting that I'd be willing to um, have some, ex ex figure out a way to explore how to come up with ways so that people can more safely camp. I, when I say that with the idea that yes, we want people in shelter, but it, as um, uh, we heard from some of the, the the folks who work with the houseless population at community resources, there's there's a lot of people that just don't want to go into shelters. Well, not a lot, but there are some, and that there's that and um, and that they have concerns about being in a shelter, and they even under these brutal climate, uh, the you know winter conditions, that they'd actually prefer to be in a tent rather than in a shelter. And I think that um, coming up with a way that folks could, um, uh, I, th I think it's worth exploring a way for people to camp in a safer, more sanitary um, way than some of them are doing right now. Um, so maybe I'm suggesting an action there to my, Motion for non-action. <laughs> I, I certainly would not support any ordinances that prohibit um, temporary structures and encampments. Like Westfield does have one. Um, so, but we are going to see a lot more house unhoused people, especially after the winter, with um, after the evictions. As a warm as the weather warms, we will see more. Um, because we have the services in this town. And so, yeah, it will become more um, relevant. I think that you will be seeing this again. Um, the council will, not, not our committee that's ending, but how, I don't know if you can make a motion to not, not create ordinances that would harm people that live outdoors or? Is it worth adding this to a narrative that accompanies the report? Hmm. I would like to do that for 
I would like to do that for each of the chapters of ordinances for housing, for zoning, um, what's left. <laughs> I, I could add a, a note that, um, that this was uh, brought to the committee and that while the committee did not support, um, did not see the need to uh, to recommend an ordinance that legalizes temporary structures, uh, the committee also uh, did not would would not have supported any ordinance that would um, impede uh, those who choose to um, reside outside of a, a traditional house. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I see a lot of in camp, you know, people camped in the in the meadows or when I walk my dog in the meadows, there are definitely people living down there. Okay. Conservation that's, land? Yep. That's not conservation land. No. All right. So any further discussion? Okay, Jeff, roll call. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Lavard. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano is a yes. Okay, moving on. Public comment by Raza Berenson Chair. A November 30, 2020 meeting and November 18, 2020 email from Tay Porco, chapter 245, peddling and soliciting. Request to stop criminalizing and harassing unhoused people asking for money or panhandling on the street without a permit. At December 15, 2020 meeting, attorney Seawall clarified that the city never enforces anti-panhandling laws. The Supreme Judicial Court today struck down the state anti-panhandling statute as unconditional and in violation of the First Amendment. There is no, has been no, and will be no enforcement of anti-panhandling, he stressed. It is First Amendment protecting and perfectly permissible and there's nothing they are going to do about it. There are a couple of areas they don't enforce, signs and panhandling. Heard from city solicitor that panhandling is protected by the First Amendment and panhandling soliciting ordinances are not enforced by the city, December 15, 2020. In parentheses, the list of demands from unhoused organizers referred to bucket number two, November 30th, 2020. Councilor Nash. Yes, and I did a quick review of our ordinance today and there's no mention of outlawing panhandling or uh, soliciting of money. Um, so just, you know, I just wanted to make one quick check around that. We're not only not enforcing, you know, uh, prohibition on panhandling we, we it's not on the books so and i'm gonna leave the meeting for one minute to go use the facilities i'll be right back okay. i will also let you know that i have been um contacted by the aclu general counsel uh in boston uh to inform me of the uh striking down of the state law and I have assured her that uh, we have no panhandling, anti-panhandling statutes. And if we did, we wouldn't enforce them. And we, we do not uh, enforce the state law. I have been in touch with the police chief about that. She was aware of it. And uh, there are no anti-panhandling ordinances on our books. All of chapter 245 all deals with commercial uh, peddling and soliciting. Um, and including hawkers and or peddlers of fish, fruits, and vegetables. Um, so I, I can assure you that there's no panhandling uh, ordinances. Thank you, Attorney Seawald. Okay. I'm going to, you know, Councilor Nash should be back here anytime soon. Make a motion not to refer this. Um, but with an explanation in our um, report as to why. Do I hear a second? A second that. Thank you. Discussion. Still waiting for Councilor Nash to come back, but just wanted to make that. 
you can probably pass it without him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kyle, turn to see Walt's face shaking his head. We can pass it without him. You know. Yep. All right, Wall call. All right, Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Barge. Yes. Uh, Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano is a yes. Okay. Yeah. Too late. It's done. <laughs> we're, <laughs> moving on. we're moving on. You know. Well, I had you on. I, you know, I... <laughs> after the stunt you pulled last week, we're not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> So next up is Tay Porco's list of demand request to enforce the ban the box law in Northampton workplaces. Porco stated that while ban the box is a Massachusetts state law prohibits in parentheses prohibits employers from asking about criminal background as part of the job application process, local employers are not being held accountable for compliance, urged counselors to put enforcement in place. Referred to bucket number two, November 30th, 2020. Turn to see while you're mute. We have no authority to enforce state law. Right. Um, do I hear a motion? Make that motion. Not, not to refer, but for an explanation. And I'll second that to the discussion. Councillor Nash. Councillor mm -hmm. Nash. Yeah, you know, if we could, I'd be all about enforcing this. I think, you know, as somebody who's worked in employment all my life with people with disabilities and, um, you know, and, and the, 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 the folks who've, you know, been a part of the criminal justice system to be, have that, you know, that um, piece of information always uh, uh, stuck to them, you know, even as they try to, you know, uh, become, um, you know, upstanding citizens, quote unquote, you know, that I, I yeah, I, I, I would wholeheartedly uh, support that we, although it's outside of our purview. So, um, and something yeah. tells me maybe Councillor Thorpe might have something to say about it too. <laughs> Are these cases <laughs> refer to MCAD? I mean, the, all these sort of, is that the entity that manages all these, you know, complaints? No, this, this is the, this is the Corey law again. And, uh, and it, there's a criminal systems history board that uh, oversees this. And, you know, again, um, I understand Councillor Nash's concern and I, and I may even share that concern but again, the legislature specifically amended the statute to allow employers access to this information. So I don't think there's anything that we can do about it other than to contact our state legislators and, uh, and see if we can get them to try and change the, the state law. That's, that's the most we could, that's really what needs to happen is state law needs to be changed. I make the motion to, to um, uh, was language disregard this one? Not refer, but with an explanation as to. Right. Second. No further discussion. Roll call, Jeff. All right. Uh, Councilor Thorpe? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yep. Councilor Nash? Yes. Member Peck? Oh. Member Did Peck? I... Did you say yes or no? Oh, yes. Oh. Um, and, and member Napolitano was a yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Megan. Sorry. Okay. Next on the list is Tay Porco's list of demands requests to create an ordinance that imposes penalties and incentivizes against the maintenance of private property vacancies. Refer to bucket number two on November 30th, 2020. Okay, open, do I hear a motion? Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion that we do not recommend this at this time. Motion made by Councilor Nash, seconded by 
I'll second it. Jeff Napolitano, discussion. Ernie Seewald, do you have any? Uh, you know, I, I, I will say, and I, I, I'll say this without, uh, <coughs> at the risk of uh, stepping, um, you know, speaking out of turn, but this is something that the mayor and I have talked about over the years, and it is a concern. And we have one particular landowner who is of particular concern in this regard and who keeps property vacant for a very long time, and it's not a good thing in our downtown. Um, I think that, um, you know, we're going to have more vacancies in downtown as we emerge from this pandemic. And, um, um, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to study uh, or try to figure out ways to motivate landowners to um, not hold properties off, uh, off the market and keep them vacant. Um, I think that we'd have to figure out exactly how we do it before I know how we would propose to do it before I know whether it's something that we could actually legally do. I mean, the other side of the coin is, of course, these are private properties and landowners have their own reasons for keeping properties vacant. And um, uh, so this is a difficult one. Okay. Any comments? Uh, I don't see you, Councilman Nash. Do you have anything you would like yeah, to say? What? Yeah, so I want to say two things here. First, I want to say, I want to say thank you to Tay Porco for bringing all of this stuff forward, because it had us do our due diligence around all of these things that, um, that you know, that um, as an advocate of, for houseless people, I you know I appreciated being challenged on what is it you're doing, and that um, and that it it caused me to do a lot of research here and, and all of us to really look into what the city's doing. Um, so I appreciate that. And then number two, uh, in relation to um, Attorney Seawald's quest to find a way that we can, can um, take action here, it ha I had this thought of like, well, we the, the streetscape in front of these, these uh, storefronts is ours. The sidewalk is ours, right up into right up into the door, and we could we could turn that into a, a gallery space, or we we could do things in that right of way that um, so that we are no longer looking at empty storefronts with uh, you know uh, posters pinned up on them. That um, and I I don't know how if we could legally do that but it was just the thought i had but i still stick with my original uh the the original motion to uh, not take action on this at this time okay hmm. councilor okay. Lavard. yeah um this is a question for attorney seawald attorney seawald all right say the building that there's concerns about how can a landlord get away with letting a building just sit there? What would be that purpose for that landlord or the owner of that building to just let it sit there? I mean, what is he getting out of that? I, I really can't speak to the individual motivations of any particular land landowner or you know, building owner. I don't know. I, I have no idea why uh, why any landowner would leave spaces so many spaces vacant for so long. I, I I I often comment on I just don't understand the motivation, and I and if you think this particular landowner has a lot of vacant properties here, you should see what he has in Holyoke, even more. <laughs> and it is it is a a business model that I just do not understand and I will go to my grave not understanding it. That said, um, he pays his taxes and you know, I think that on some level he may just have a right to do with 
his property as he sees fit. Mm -hmm. um, That's what I mean. If a, say a, a piece of property just sits there and sits there, it's deteriorating. If it is deteriorating, making a city, especially like Main Street or up in Florence, whatever, right? Looking bad, doesn't a city have the rights to do something about that? Well, I, I think he has the right to put posters in his windows. I mean, that's First Amendment expression, unless we're going to have a, you know, a, um, an overall prohibition on communication through windows. And this could be done in, an, in, a, in a manner that is, uh, you know, content neutral. Um, he has, but his building is not deteriorating any more than any other building. I mean, actually the upper floors are mostly filled. And mm -hmm. so there is commercial activity happening in these buildings um, and they're private property. I mean, do you have a right if you move out of your house to just have it vacant? Or do you, can we force you to lease your house? So. I have a question of if a piece of property, no matter who it is on Main Street or Florence, okay, that own the property and it starts deteriorating and it doesn't look good for a city, just like in Springfield with some of the houses and so forth like that. You don't have to tell me about Holyoke. I have many relatives in Holyoke and I yep. understand where you're coming at about that. So how do we find a way to clean up that act? Well, I mean, I, I, I just don't know that his buildings are physically deteriorating any more than other buildings in town are physically deteriorating. And I'm not just talking uh, about that person. I'm talking and, about Well, you know, they, if we can come up with standards for maintenance of buildings, yeah. um, perhaps, but that doesn't have anything, that doesn't really speak to um, Ms. Porco's uh, suggestion that we prohibit um, um, you know, vacancies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that also becomes more difficult in times like these, because I think we're going to see more vacancies. And I think that it's going to be, you know, it's going to be some period of time before we get back up to the, uh, you know, to the occupancy levels that we've been used to in other buildings. So what happens in those situations? So we're speaking right now about vacancy not you know the deterioration of the exterior of the building so roll call yes i, I just want to say i've talked to a lot of people and whatever's going on there matches no business model that anybody followed right it, it, it makes no sense that why you would have a commercial space that you don't just put something in there to make some money. And for decades of empty space just makes no people who invest in commercial properties just like this this makes no sense. Well, it does. <laughs> and the church up on West Street, um, it's like, uh, according to Louis, before he left, this was years ago. It was almost completed as a, as a, it was almost done. He has the whole thing almost finished and he just never finished it. Well, it's just, we're, we're moving on time here. I want to get this roll yeah. call. Councilor Thor. I think we've had this discussion before. Go ahead. Councilor Thor. <laughs> and it's never going to end. Yep. Nope. Councilor Council Labarge. <laughs> yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. Okay. The Volatano is, is yes. Good. Moving One on. More. One more. Councillor Alex, Councillor Alex Jarrett, Section 350-7.2, General Sign Regulation C, Temporary Freestanding Ground Signs Advocating Any Candidacy or Cause Which Is Under Consideration at a Particular <coughs> Election or Any Other Cause or Issue Not to Exceed One Sign Per Candidate Cause Per Lot shall be permitted provided that such signs it's there's nothing more 
recommended city council review sign ordinance based on Supreme Court decision, Reed versus Town of Gilbert, December 7, 2020. Okay. I do know, I think we had this meeting and I believe at that time, Councilor Seawall was aware of this and they were looking at, um, or in discussion with the city council president regarding this issue. Would you like to be heard on it, uh, Attorney Seawald? Well, uh, all, sure. Um, the, the proposal is unconstitutional. We cannot distinguish uh, between or among signs based on what they say. So if it's a political candidate or a, uh, you know, eat at Joe's Cafe, uh, there is no difference between those signs or any other sign. So the content of the sign is irrelevant. Um, and so the, uh, the all sign regulations need to be content neutral. And so we can um, regulate signs for aesthetics and for safety. And the, the devil in, this, in these details is how many signs, how close to sidelines, how large, neon flashing or not those are the kinds of things we can regulate and they are very difficult political decisions to be made and i think that's where we're hung up that, motion to you know, oh. sorry i was gonna make a motion <laughs> so Ooh, motion to uh, not refer this um, and uh, to associate with the comments of the city solicitor just now. Sorry, get a second. Second. Discussion. Attorney Seawald, anything else to add? No, I'm all set, thanks. Okay. Okay. Just wanna say, I hate lawn signs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm ready to vote. <laughs> okay. We'll call Jeff. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yep. Councilor Nash. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano was a yes. Okay. Thank you. So we've gone through all of that. Um, it, Loris, let me see. Next on the list was a continuation of discussion of the final report. Um, Can I make a motion to? Continue, continue the, the continuation of this discussion at the next meeting. Second. Yeah. Oh, I'll second that. Well, too late. <laughs> well, okay. Councilor oh. Thorpe seconded, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's good. We're just going to, we're going to have it on the next agenda anyway. And, um, you know, Laura has enough on her plate. So, um, I think Attorney Seawald, if I'm not, you, you, you have something to go with, I believe, and um, at least for a start when of the draft. When is the next meeting? It's next Monday. It is next Monday because it's not in my calendar. So I'll have to put it in my calendar. Okay, I'm going to do my very best to have at least a rough okay. draft of. Wait of, a minute. Uh, We're not meeting on the No, it's not next Monday. I have legislative matters on the Right. It's two weeks. Right. It's the 15th. So it's in two weeks, I, I will plan to circulate in the interim a rough draft of a, uh, you know at least part of a, uh, a report and uh, as always uh, don't uh, don't reply all please uh, to it thank you next uh, so next we have the motion to adjourn okay. <laughs> I didn't hear that uh, seconded okay <laughs> And, and I'll make the motion. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. I get a roll, roll call, please, on the motion. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. <laughs> Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Uh, Member Peck. Yes, please. Member Napolitano was a yes. Okay. <laughs>